Among all the other events of the last few years, you might have missed this one. We turn now to male infertility, and we could be headed toward a crisis. And this morning, researchers are sounding the alarm after finding Western men are only half as fertile as they were just 40 years ago. Yep, a sperm Armageddon. Spermageddon. This is the fun name for the idea that sperm counts are falling precipitously. It made a big splash in 2017 following the publication of this study. These researchers reviewed hundreds of studies from 1973 to 2011. Big picture? They seemed to find a nearly 60% drop in total sperm count among men who live here, 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 and here. 60%. That sounds pretty bad. I mean, I'm used to hearing doom and gloom predictions about my declining fertility, but I thought that this side was spared. But after learning more about these little guys, including a personal lecture on male fertility from Dr. Smith here, I think this story is much more of a cautionary tale of what happens when media hype gets too close to the boundaries between what we do know from science and what we don't yet know. And that hype is obscuring the arguably much more important, but less flashy information. Male fertility is a pretty understudied realm of science. A 2018 symposium in Sweden called it surprisingly neglected. You need a lot of money and you need the right people, scientists and clinicians together in the same spot. That doesn't happen very often. It's so under-researched that according to Dr. Smith, we still don't even know a lot about how sperm are made, which leaves clinicians like him with a dearth of diagnostic options. I can get a semen analysis. I have some hormone blood tests. That's most of it. We have not really develop new diagnostic tests. So bearing that in mind, yes, sperm counts are probably declining. But it's not like it's declining to zero next week. And they might be declining in one very specific way, which we will get to later. But there are a whole lot of caveats that were lost in the original Spermageddon hype, most of which come down to this. Although sperm has long fascinated scientists, Modern semen analysis is still pretty new and imprecise. New because the World Health Organization only standardized methods of analysis in 1980, and they've continued to evolve up through the early 2000s. And imprecise because counting sperm is just tricky business. Let's say you have two milliliters of semen. You don't actually look at all two milliliters of semen. You actually take a small portion of that out. So you gotta make sure that the sample's mixed up really well, so you get a representative sample of the whole thing. Think of it like this cake. There are raspberries in here, and if I wanted to know exactly how many, I could cut a representative sample slice, count the raspberries in that slice, and then multiply it by the total number of slices. I'm sorry, I'm not a baker. But if I happen to cut a slice with an unusually small number of raspberries, I would get a low overall raspberry count. By the way, I ran this metaphor by Dr. Smith and he approved. Yeah, that's exactly right. Another issue is that a single semen analysis isn't that useful. The body is constantly producing and ejecting sperm cells. So taking one sample at one time doesn't give an overall accurate picture. I'll commonly see, you know, same guy, same lab, but a week or two different, 25, sometimes 50% variation, but it's, it's expensive and a hassle and stuff like that to, to get a semen analysis. So usually I'll, I'll stick with about two. This is why different labs often get wildly varied sperm counts from the same semen samples and why andrologists like Dr. Smith weren't quite as freaked out by the 2017 Spermageddon panic as the rest of us. I was surprised to learn that the science behind Spermageddon was so slippery because the hype was so dramatic. But a lot of that comes down to, it's just a sensational topic, especially if you want a super dramatic headline. Just look at these three back-to-back -back studies from Denmark, Sweden, and Finland. The first two found no decline in sperm count, but the third did. Guess which one made it to BBC News? There was even another spermageddon panic back in 1992. But just because it's overly hyped doesn't mean there's no reason to be concerned about your swimmers. There's that one particular reason I teased at the beginning, and I'm teasing again right now. But just generally, infertility can be a real struggle. In the US, about one in eight heterosexual couples struggle to conceive. And one third of those problems are due exclusively to a problem on the male side. But an unknown amount comes from just existing in the modern world. 
like the presence of BPA and pesticides in consumer products or pollution in the air. I think there are lots of things that can significantly impact sperm counts that we didn't have to face 100 years ago. Go on, say it with me. More research, please! Okay, if you're still here, get excited because I can finally say something definitive about the science of sperm. Here it is. Your overall sperm count doesn't matter for your fertility nearly as much as this measurement. Total modal sperm count. Modal sperm are those that are alive and wriggling, and thus able to make the long journey to an egg. If you have enough modal sperm, it can counteract a low overall sperm count. Maybe the sperm count is 10 million, but your motility is 75% and your volume is five milliliters. So overall, you're okay, even if it's a little bit low. Brace yourselves, it's math time. Total modal sperm count is concentration times volume times motility percentage. If you have a concentration of 40 million sperm per milliliter and your average ejaculate is two milliliters, that's 80 million sperm. If your motility percentage is low, say 20%, you'd only have 16 million modal sperm per ejaculation, placing you here, as in you might have trouble conceiving without treatment. But if your motility is 80%, you'd have 64 million modal sperm, placing you here, meaning you'll probably conceive without trouble provided your partner is also fertile. All clear? Do I need to make another cake metaphor? This is not a revelation for Dr. Smith and his colleagues, but it was for me. And if the reaction to Spermageddon and Spermageddon the 1990s edition is any indication, it will be for a lot of people. Now, I know I just spent the last however many minutes warning you about the dangers of the media overhyping individual studies, but I'm just going to end with this. These are two studies that found recent drops in total modal sperm count over about 15 years starting in the early 2000s. Yep. If this has left you feeling a bit down, I'd say lobby for more andrology research, especially if you happen to have any control over how that money gets distributed. And in the meantime, go to a specialist like Dr. Smith for a fertility pep talk. I like men to be in engaged in the process. I like them to understand their, um, not only their contribution in a deeper way, that there could be many health issues that are impacting their sperm quality. There are many things that a, that a man can do to make sperm quality better. It's a, you know, it, it takes two to make to make babies. So helping a man understand where his partner is coming from too, and and uh, some of her side of the equation as well. If you've ever wondered if working at one of these video production companies is kind of silly sometimes, I can confirm, yes. Yes, it is. Because sometimes you have to crochet your own props. If you like and subscribe, I will name a modal sperm after you. I said there are raspberries in here and they're all just right at the bottom. I mean, I guess leave your best tip for suspending berries and cake. There, here's how it would be reviewed on Bake Off. Um, a bit informal, a little scruffy. So anyway, here you go. Don't come to Cheddar for baking tips. You probably already knew that.